welcome to Sprott Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Partner at Sprott Asset Management. Today, I'd like to revisit one of my favorite metals, silver. And I say favorite because it's used in so many things today, and it's still also viewed as a currency, and it's also viewed as a true commodity. It gets consumed, and I thought it'd be fun to revisit silver with all the action we've seen lately. And I can't think of a better person to have on Sprott Radio than our very own Maria Smirnova, Managing Partner and Senior Portfolio Manager at Sprott Asset Management. Maria, thank you for joining Sprott Radio today. Hi, Ed. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, silver. Well, silver has really changed in the eyes of a lot of people in the last decade or so, and you've been involved with silver for for many years. Let's talk about what's happened more recently. There's been a, a fair amount of price action literally in the last month or so. You know, in your view, what do you think is driving that? Well, Interesting you bring up the last month or so. I mean, silver has been quite volatile throughout history. And it actually started picking up steam back in the fall of last year. But I think what's driving the price really recently, like you said, within a month or two, is, of course, all the news with bank failures in the U.S., a couple of bank bailouts, you know, Credit Suisse being forced to merge with UBS, Those types of news are significant in the financial arena, and they have been supporting and driving the prices of both gold and silver higher. So you're still seeing silver to a large extent, even though it's a true commodity and being consumed more than ever before. You're still really seeing it tethered to the price of gold as far as moving in conjunction with that and and being viewed as an alternative asset. I think it has both characteristics. I think it it still behaves with gold, but it has times when it behaves on its own and like you said it, it's kind of a an animal with two heads the industrial head and the monetary head and i think in the beginning of this year the the monetary head is definitely manifesting itself well it's interesting you bring that up because for so long we've always seen sort of gold and silver tethered together and more recently you're hearing more and more people talk about silver is is really kind of front and center I like to call it kind of the gateway metal to other alternative metals in battery markets and and energy markets and so forth. You almost can't do anything in technology these days without silver. So let's talk about the demand side for a minute. Where are you seeing some of the greatest demand in silver and what technologies are really dependent on silver going forward? Well, I think you bring up a great point and, and the demand side of silver, the physical side So I'm not talking about people trading silver on the COMEX. I'm talking about physical buyers in the market. That has been really exciting. We have fresh numbers out of the Silver Institute, which recently showed really how strong the physical demand for silver has been in the last year specifically. And you can pretty much talk about any area of the market, and and they are strong. I'll start with investment. The net physical investment last year rose by 22%. I mean, that's a huge increase year over year. Uh, Jewelry and silverware were also strong, also double-digit growth. You asked me, what are the exciting areas? Well, I could argue every area is exciting from the perspective that it's seen strong growth. But really, when we talk about exciting areas, we talk about electronics and electrical applications of silver. As you know, Ed, silver has wonderful properties. It's highly reflective, but it's also very, very electricity conductive. It's one of the highest conductors of electricity out there, if not the highest. And it is certainly benefiting from the global drive towards electrification. As we're using more electricity, as we're searching for alternative sources of energy, alternative to fossil fuels, that is, Definitely silver comes into play. And the first and foremost use that we're seeing growth in is photovoltaics or solar. And last year, we hit a record demand in solar, 140 million ounces, representing about 14% of supply. And it grew furthermore 28% last year. And it's furthermore, it, it's projected to continue growing at fast rates. So this is one area that we're finding very exciting. And the other one, of course, is as we're transitioning towards greater use of electric vehicles, we're seeing more and more silver being consumed. 
And the reason for that is, again, silver is used in small amounts, but in many different places. From mirrors to air conditioning to any electrical components, and particularly with EVs, that's a higher component of the car, the silver loadings are going up. And that is creating more and more silver consumption. So I would say those are the two exciting areas. You could also mention the movement towards 5G networks. We saw growth last year in that area. And again, as our networks and communication networks are becoming more sophisticated, more silver is required. There's a lot of almost conflicting information out there on the recycling site of silver. And I read recently that only about 10% of solar panels currently get recycled. And we are, by 2030, going to be having massive amounts of panels that have to be replaced globally. And many of those are simply going into landfills. I'm sure it's a price determinant, you know, right? If silver gets to a certain price, it becomes cost effective to start recycling those panels. But talk about recycling in general for a few minutes, if you could. Yeah, excellent subject. Now, let's start with the basics. Recycling currently represents about 18% of total supply. So about 82% of the market, and again, you can think of the total market, the supply side being a billion ounces, okay? So out of that, last year, 180 million ounces came from recycling. And the majority of that is coming right now from jewelry and silverware. If you think about your forks and knives and pieces of jewelry that you no longer want, that's where it's coming from. And to your point, that is highly price sensitive. Uh, someone has to be motivated to bring their old things to be you know, recycled. So in the past, I would say seven, eight years, we've gained about 35 million ounces through recycling. That was the growth, okay? However, in terms of mine production, in the same period of time, we lost almost 80 million ounces from declining mine supply. You brought up solar panel recycling. You're absolutely correct. About one in 10 currently get recycled. My understanding is the technology is not quite there. And also we haven't had that big wave of panels coming out of production that need to be recycled. So we as humanity have not been forced to create the technology to recycle these things efficiently. And yes, it is very price sensitive as well. But I think, I guess what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is Overall, right now, recycling, while significant in the market, has not been able to offset the decline that we've seen from mine production. And having higher prices from seven, eight years ago has not helped us create that much more supply from recycling. And again, projections for this year, actually, for recycling to be flat, so not to have any gains. So I don't see that as a big area to contribute to overall supply of the metal. Well, let's let's stick with that for a second. So I, I get the recycling side. You talked about mine supply and how that's depleting. You know what? What are some of the primary reasons behind that or drivers behind that? Why why is mine supply depleting? Well, I think that's quite simple. The silver price has been bumping around between $17 and $25. So right now we're sitting about 24, which is great, of course. But there's been lots of periods of time when silver price dropped to $17, $18. And at those levels, the mining industry has not had sufficient stimulus or incentive to go out there and find new deposits and build new mines. It's very hard to finance a new silver mine. Well, first of all, let's start at the beginning. It's very hard to find a substantial new silver mine. And by that, I mean anywhere between 10 and 20 million ounces. Those are considered big silver mines. And they're just not, they're hard to come by. And, you know, COVID, of course, also did not help. There was a lot of shutdowns, as you know, in COVID time. And frankly, we have had a bit of a bounce back, but the bounce back has been very, very disappointing. There are some mines who shut down permanently. There are mines that have been depleting their resources and their grades have been going down. So the richness of the mines have been declining. And that has not been replaced, like I said, through new exploration and through new mines coming onto production. And the reason for that, I think, again, is this quote-unquote depressed silver price. I truly believe we need a higher silver price to create more supply. That really dovetails into the health and the development or the growth of 
mining stocks in general, in particular silver mining companies. And also, I guess, a one-off from that would be from a geopolitical standpoint. You know, there are certain parts of the world where it's just kind of no-go zone with risk of nationalization and rule of law and those sort of things. So maybe that contributes a bit as well. Could you spend a few minutes then talking specifically about not just the physical metal, the you know, silver itself, but what about the miners themselves? You know, what challenges are you seeing out there for the existing mines and, and potentially new mines coming online? What are you seeing there on the, on the mining side? Well, on the mining side, you have to kind of go where geology is. Where is silver prevalent? It's in Latin America and the whole belt up to Mexico and even the United States, right? And Canada. But in Canada, we really don't mine for silver for some reason. But So it's that whole mountainous range of subduction and zones where we see a lot of silver. So countries like... Peru, Argentina, Mexico, again, Mexico is very rich in silver. In a lot of these countries that are developing countries still, we're seeing political unrest. We had riots and protests in Peru. We had changes of government in Peru. Similarly, in Mexico, the new president has been talking about mining reforms very recently in Mexico, we are reading that they are proposing mining reforms. In fact, it's concrete now. And these reforms, if they go through, will make it more difficult for mining companies to gain concessions and, more importantly, develop their mining concessions. So these are definitely factors that are contributing to um, a slower than we would like expansion of the mine supply. For what you've said so far today, the demand doesn't seem to be abating by any way, shape or form. Effectively, you've got a squeeze in supply from the mining side. You've got recycling kind of, I think you said around 18% right now, total supply, and yet demand spiking. So I got to believe prices continue to look pretty attractive, at least over the next, you know, one to three years. If in fact, we continue to use all these technologies like self-driving cars and solar panels and all the reflective technology we need. It seems like the future for silver could potentially be very attractive. What do you think the overall health of the silver market is today? The silver market is a study in in sharp contrasts, okay? And I will explain that statement. As we've discussed, uh, last year we had a record physical deficit of almost 240 million ounces. So I talked about the size of the supply being a billion ounces. Well, the total demand was actually 1.24 billion. So we were short 240 million ounces. That is a huge number if you think about it. And in fact, that has contributed to a decline in global inventories of silver. That's logical as, as we have deficits. They draw down inventories. Otherwise, where does the silver come from? But the price has really been driven by not necessarily the physical market, but more, I would say, the paper market, the trading on the COMEX, and overall, primarily institutional investors. Last year alone, we saw a decline of about 125 million ounces in exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. And that, I think, is what's been driving the price, right? It's that institutional lack of demand or interest and unfortunately, the retail interest, so when we talk about, you know, coins, bars, that demand, that is mostly retail demand. And the industrial demand has not been able to offset and contribute to the price rise. Now, I will say, though, I think that will change. And again, the reason I think it'll change is because for the next five years, we're forecasting deficits for at least the next five years. And this information is coming from Metals Focus and the Silver Institute, so I'm not making it up. There's a pronounced lack of new supply with a very pronounced growth in demand, which has created the situation. But I don't think people are realizing the gravity of the situation. And I think as time goes on year over year, and as we continue drawing down the stocks in London, on the COMEX, as those physical ounces disappear, that balance between institutional investors controlling the price to the physical market controlling the price, that might very well change in my mind. We just need to continue down this path of eating up all the supply that we have and not replenishing it. And sooner or later, the fundamentals will win, I think. But so far, I do believe that the price has been driven by more institutional lack of demand and paper trading, really. 
Is it fair to say that silver is at an inflection point of going from a metal that you trade to a metal that you invest in for multiple market cycles? You know, we at Sprott do a lot of work with private families and big institutions, and many times they look at assets and they look at investments for the next 10, 20, 30 years. It seems to me that, again, as long as the technology is going to demand silver, as long as the supply continues to be constrained, there's a pretty unique opportunity here over you know the next you know couple market cycles for sure. Sometimes it's very frustrating for me to look at the price of silver and if it's not acting very well, you know, I, I think it's it can be very frustrating. Like I said, but the reality is, I think there is a change happening in the market, and and we discuss these changes. You know, this electrification theme will not go away. The world is moving towards cleaner energy. And silver, it plays an integral role in that. By the same token, I would say that the governments of the world have not fixed their fundamental issues and have not figured out how to run their finances better, which means only one thing. They will print more and more fiat currencies. And I do believe in silver and gold as protectors against fiat currency debasement. So for me, those two key factors for silver, and again, it's great that it play, plays both roles, they provide a great investment thesis for the metal. Yeah, I think that's one of the most unique things about silver is it can serve both sides, right? It can serve as a natural kind of low-cost liquid hedge to the, the broader markets, but also from a demand standpoint, from a technology standpoint, I think there's a lot of things happening in silver today that, that's pretty exciting. So what I would just tell all of our listeners today, first and foremost, thank you for listening to Sprott Radio. But more importantly, for those that want to learn more about Sprott and Maria's work in silver and our white papers and our stats that we put out, we encourage you to, to visit us at Sprott.com, which is S-P-R-O-T-T.com, where you can learn more about everything Sprott, but specifically silver and more importantly, uh, Maria's work in silver. So once again, I'm Ed Coyne, and you're listening to Sprott Radio. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only from sources believed to be reliable. However, Sprout does not warrant its completeness or accuracy. Any opinions and estimates constitute our judgment as of the date of this material and are subject to change without notice. Past performance is not indicative of future results. This communication is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Any opinions and recommendations herein do not take into account individual client circumstances, objectives, or needs, and are not intended as recommendations of particular securities, financial instruments, or strategies. You must make your own independent decisions regarding any securities, financial instruments, or strategies mentioned or related to the information herein. This communication may not be redistributed or retransmitted in whole or in part or in any form or manner without the express written consent of Sprott. Any unauthorized use or disclosure is prohibited. Receipt and review of this information constitutes your agreement not to redistribute or retransmit the contents and information contained in this communication without first obtaining express permission from an authorized officer of Sprott.